Dopamine detox, it actually can be quite useful to take some time and space away from social media, certainly from any addictive drugs, that's the treatment for addiction, and restore those dopamine levels to baseline. You know, if you drive those dopaminergic states too long, addictive drugs, etc., people can do this with sex, food, drugs, gambling, social media, all sorts of things, pornography, you know, what ends up happening is the amount of dopamine that's released over time goes down and down and down and down and pretty much is traversing into the territory of pain. And then people, again, are back to this thing where, you know, they're scrolling internet porn eight, nine ten times or hours a day. And then they're wondering like why this isn't effective for them anymore, whereas it was before. You know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it's extreme forms. It's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind, extremely powerful palatable food, extreme pornography, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. And the higher the dopamine peak, the bigger the drop afterwards. And it's not that you drop to baseline, you drop below baseline. So these things aren't good or bad, they just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. Dopamine is almost always discussed in terms of pleasure, but it's the molecule of motivation, drive, and to some extent, reward. It tends to narrow our visual focus. And believe it or not, dopamine is the molecule from which adrenaline is manufactured. Biochemically, you get adrenaline from dopamine. So these two act as close cousins to put us into these states of motivation and have energy to pursue things. The cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states. These are natural rhythms that existed in the nervous system. We had to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for as a generic form of motivation and pursuit. You can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true. But you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also. That's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, etc., when we're pursuing things. But the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. You just set some milestone. And the key thing here is that, and this is the beauty of the dopamine system, just like the stress system is generic, the fear system is generic. It's designed for a bunch of different scenarios. The motivation system is also generic. It can be to achieve the next lamppost as a milestone, or it can be five miles as the next milestone. You get to control that. And it, so it's completely arbitrary. It's all internal, right? If you finish a marathon in first place, no one comes along and drips dopamine in your ear. You self-generate that. It's all internal. It's all about your internal representation. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good and bad events in life, but the fact of the matter is that if you set the next milestone as just outside the distance of what you're comfortable with and you make it there, if you allow yourself a moment to register that win, you get energy to then set the next milestone and achieve it. That energy is dopamine converted into epinephrine, into adrenaline. When dopamine is very present in our system, or if you're in the company of someone else and there's a lot of dopamine, two things happen. First of all, you're very motivated, narrowing your focus, that's one. The other is that the way that you perceive time is quite a bit different. For instance, if you ever had an amazingly exciting day, just tons of things, maybe you meet someone new, you're having the best time. I mean, just think falling in love and the, the most incredible date that you can imagine how it begins and how it ends, it just feels incredible. It all feels like it went by very, very fast. And yet when you look back on that day, it seems like so much happened. Now think about an opposite situation. You go to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the doctor's lobby and you're waiting and you're waiting and there's no phone reception so you can't scroll Instagram. You're waiting and you're waiting. It's incredibly boring. It's a very low dopamine state. It feels like it goes on forever. And yet when you look back, nothing really happened. So dopamine changes our perception of time. We often hear that, you know, that social media is getting dopamine hit after dopamine hit. When we first get on social media for the first time or after a long period of time, the amount of dopamine that's released we think is quite substantial. It's novel. Remember, dopamine is about novelty, surprise, and the sense that we are on some exciting track. 
That's what dopamine is really about. It puts us into states of readiness, anticipation, looking, seeking, etc. almost always for things outside the confines of our skin. Serotonin does the opposite. When there's a lot of serotonin in our brain and body, typically it makes us feel satisfied, sated, and more quiescent, comfortable with what we have in our own immediate sphere and within us, right? The comfort of a good meal, the food you have, dopamine is about go, go, go. If you look at somebody who's high on cocaine or methamphetamine, it's all about pursuit because that's a very dopaminergic drug. You look at somebody who's taking a drug, and I'm not suggesting people do this, but it really ramps up serotonin. The side effects of those drugs, if the dosages are too high, lack of appetite, lack of libido, kind of meh about life, you know, then so they'll adjust the dose down. That's because those are serotonergic drugs. So in general, when we are in pursuit of things, dopamine is quite high. So the thing about cell phones is when you first get on there, let's say you're it, no Wi-Fi on the flight or something, and you land, it can actually be quite stimulating. You get a lot of dopamine. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. But very quickly, when you're scrolling on social media, you're no longer getting the novelty, but you're continuing to do it, and you almost don't know why you're doing it. At that point, it shifts over to something that's a bit more like an obsessive compulsive behavior, where we can define an obsessive compulsive behavior where the obsession leads to a compulsion. So the obsession is a thought, the compulsion is a behavior, but the acting out of the compulsion merely serves to increase the obsession, right? This is very different than being obsessed with food or obsessed with cleanliness. There's no payoff. Right, exactly. There's no anxiety relief by carrying out the compulsion. With OCD behaviors, like scrolling social media, the dopamine quickly wanes and then you find that you're just sort of, and we've all been there, you're scrolling, you're like, why am I doing this? This isn't that interesting. That is, this isn't that interesting. Now, in the algorithms that they've incorporated function on the, the most powerful way to keep people doing a behavior or an animal for that matter is intermittent random reward, a random intermittent reward that you don't know when you're going to hit the jackpot. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, and then you see something. Typically, it's very high what, you know, in nerd speak, we'd say signal to noise. So if you're reading some interesting things, this came out in the news, this came out, and then it's all of a sudden a riot or a person that is jump, is base jumping off a building. But look, if something's very tragic, then that has this gravitational pull. And then you, what happens is you start getting the system working for that next dopamine hit that you don't know when it's going to come. It's just like gambling. So I look at social media as initially being very dopaminergic, driving reward, surprise, and excitement, but very quickly transitioning to something more like OCD. If we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. If you saw an animal digging in the corner, looking, 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 looking for a bone, a dog is looking, 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 you'd think that's really sad. That's us. Right, that's us, I'm pointing at myself intentionally, that's us. So we have to learn to self-regulate the amount of time, but that doesn't have to be a process of, you know, scruffing ourselves and saying, don't do it, don't do it. Think about it in terms of the positive. The more time away from something, the more positively reinforcing it will be when you return. And not just to sort of superimpose this onto the relationship conversation, you know, Many of us are fortunate to have partners that we love spending a lot of time with. It's also good to miss that person every once in a while. Now that might be an hour for some people apart of no communication. It might be a week. Everyone varies on this, on this spectrum. But the idea of missing someone is that positive anticipation, that kind of pain, right? It's a motivational state. And then when you see them, it's all the richer. So you can imagine that the, these dopamine circuits can be used to more successfully navigate a number of different things. And, you know, a lot of couples completely quash the excitement and the pleasure of being together, not just physical pleasure, but just pleasure of being together because they just spend too much damn time too much together. Or they're texting all the time, right? Or they're, you know, and, and this whole thing around texting has become a really interesting test of dopamine expectation. There's a thing called dopamine reward prediction error. If you think the reward is coming and it doesn't, you drop below baseline levels of dopamine. I think the key is to to leverage dopamine reward prediction error in the best way. It's the surprise that, you know, if you take kids, you're driving home from school and suddenly you pull into the ice cream shop, they're going to be so ecstatic. But if you tell them you get to go to the ice cream shop and it's closed, huge drop below baseline. They literally tear out into surprise is the maximum dopamine release. Then successful completion of the mission, so, <laughs> as it were, is the next and then unsuccessful. Anticipation is the kind of ultimate fuel of the courting dance. You know, you look at people who are successful in life and you always hear success builds success. And it's absolutely true. Same thing with kids. I mean, getting some success early on, even if it's low bar success, really does build up 
one's positive anticipation and ability to perform well in the future because dopamine gives energy. Remember, it's the precursor to adrenaline and the sense that the strongest motivation is always gonna be intrinsic motivation. If you reward kids or adults for something too many times, even if they like that activity, the propensity to do that activity will be reduced. But if you reward without effort or without success, that is devastating for a nervous system. In fact, I've gone on record and I'll say it again and again and again, which is that dopamine that arrives without prior effort destroys people. This is drugs. This is, uh, you know, this is things like uh, cocaine and amphetamine. It's high levels of dopamine with no effort. Okay, they had to buy it, they had to find it, they did whatever it, but it's no, there's no physical effort or mental effort involved in getting the dopamine peak. This is why hard work followed by reward, great. Working hard on a relationship and then it gets better, or there's a breakthrough, or whatever it is. That is powerfully positive. Dopamine that just arrives because you say, oh, you're here, so you get reward, terrible. And this is why rewarding every little positive thing that a child does with you know, their favorite thing eventually diminishes the value of that thing and diminishes their ability to get motivated on their own. It's a very, very powerful system. One has to be very, very careful how one leverages it. But staying out of you know, high intensity, um, highly rewarding activities, I think could be useful in terms of reestablishing that dopamine balance.